How to Pray by R.A. Torrey. Chapter 10. When to Pray. Read by Peter John Parises, also known as Brian Dean. If we would know the fullness of blessing that there is in the prayer life, it is important not only that we pray in the right way, but also that we pray at the right time. Christ's own example is full of suggestiveness as to the right time for prayer. Number one, in the first chapter of Mark, the 35th verse, we read, quote, And in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed, unquote. Jesus chose the early morning hour for prayer. Many of the mightiest men of God have followed the Lord's example of this. In the morning hour, the mind is fresh and at its very best. It is free from distraction, and that absolute concentration upon God, which is essential to the most effective prayer, is most easily possible in the early morning hours. Furthermore, when the early hours are spent in prayer, the whole day is sanctified and powered is obtained for overcoming its temptations and for performing its duties. More can be accomplished in prayer in the first hours of the day than at any other time during the day. Every child of God who would make the most out of his life for Christ should set apart the first part of the day to meeting God in the study of his word and in prayer. The first thing we do each day should be to go along with God and face the duties, the temptations, and the service of that day, and get strength from God for all. We should get victory before the hour of trial, temptation, or service comes. The secret place of prayer is the place to fight our battles and gain our victories. Number two. In the sixth chapter of Luke, in the twelfth verse, we get further light upon the right time to pray. We read, quote, And it came to pass in those days that he went out into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. Unquote. Here we see Jesus praying in the night, spending the entire night in prayer. Of course, we have no reason to suppose that this was the constant practice of our Lord, nor do we even know how common this practice was. But there were certainly times when the whole night was given up to prayer. Here, too, we do well to follow in the footsteps of the Master. Of course, there is a way of setting apart nights of prayer in which there is no profit. It is pure legalism, but the abuse of this practice is no reason for neglecting it altogether. One ought not to say, quote, I am going to spend a whole night in prayer, quote, with the thought that there is any merit that will win God's favor in such an exercise. That, that is legalism. But we oftentimes do well to say, quote, I am going to set apart this night for meeting God and obtaining his blessing and power. And if necessary, and if he leads, so leads me, I will give the whole night to prayer, quote. Oftentimes, we will have prayed things through long before the night is passed and we can retire and find more refreshing and invigorating sleep than if we had not spent the time in prayer. At other times, God doubtless will keep us in communion with himself away into the morning, and when he does this in his infinite grace, blessed indeed are those hours of night prayer. Nights of prayer to God are followed by days of power with men. In the night hours, the world is hushed in slumber, and we can easily be alone with God and have undisturbed communion with Him. If we set apart the whole night for prayer, there will be no hurry. There will be time for our own hearts to become quiet before God. There will be time for the whole mind to be brought under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. There will be plenty of time to pray things through. A night of prayer should be put entirely under God's control. 
we should lay down no rules as to how long we will pray or as to what we should pray about, but be ready to wait upon God for a short time or a long time as he may be and to be led out in one direction or another as he may see fit. Number three, Jesus Christ prayed before all the great crises in his earthly life. He prayed before choosing the twelve disciples, before the Sermon on the Mount, before starting out on his evangelistic tour, before his anointing with the Holy Spirit and his entrance upon public ministry, before announcing to the twelve his approaching death, before the great consummation of his life at the cross. See Luke chapter 6, verse 12 to 13, Luke 9, verse 18, 21 and 22, Luke chapter 3, verse 21 and 22, Mark chapter 1, verse 35 to 38, and Luke 22, verse 39 to 46. He prepared for every important crisis by a protracted season of prayer. So ought we to do also. Whenever any crisis of life is seen to be approaching, we should prepare for it by a season of very definite prayer to God. We should take plenty of time for this prayer. Number four. Christ prayed not only before the great events and victories of his life, but he also prayed after its great achievements and important crises. When he had fed the five thousand with the five loaves and two fishes, and the multitude desired to take him and make him king, he sent them away. He went up into the mountain apart to pray, and spent hours there alone in prayer to God. Matthew chapter 14 verse 23, and John chapter 6 verse 15. So he went on from victory to victory. It is more common for most of us to pray before the great events of life than it is to pray after them. But the latter is as important as the former. If we would pray after the great achievements of life, we might go on to still greater. As it is, we are often either puffed up or exhausted by the things that we do in the name of the Lord. And so we advance no further. Many and many a man in answer to prayer has been endued with power, and thus has wrought great things in the name of the Lord. And when these great things are accomplished, instead of going along with God and humbling himself before him and giving him all the glory for what was achieved, he has congratulated himself upon what has been accomplished, has become puffed up, and God has been obliged to lay him aside. The great things done were not followed by humiliation of self and prayer to God. And so pride has come in, and the mighty man has been shorn of his power. Number five. Jesus Christ gave a special time to prayer. When life was unusually busy, he would withdraw at such a time from the multitudes that thronged about him and go into the wilderness and pray. For example, we read in Luke chapter 5, verse 15 and 16, quote, but so much the more when abroad the report concerning him. And great multitudes came together to hear and to be healed of their infirmities. But he withdrew himself in the deserts and prayed. Unquote, RV. Some men are so busy that they find no time for prayer. Apparently, the busier Christ's life was, the more he prayed. Sometimes he had no time to eat. Mark chapter 3, verse 20. Sometimes he had no time for needed rest and sleep. Mark chapter 6, verse 31, 33, and 46. But he always took time to pray. And the more the work crowded, the more he prayed. Many a mighty man of God has learned this secret from Christ. And when the work has crowded more than usual, they have set an unusual amount of time apart for prayer. Other men of God once mighty, have lost their power because they did not learn the secret and allowed increasing work to crowd out prayer. Years ago, it was the writer's privilege with other theological students 
to ask questions of one of the most useful Christian men of the day. The writer was led to ask, quote, Will you tell us something of your prayer life? Unquote. The man was silent a moment, and then, turning his eyes earnestly upon me, replied, quote, Well, I must admit that I have been so crowded with work of light that I have not given the time I should to prayer. Unquote. Is it any wonder that that man lost power and the great work that he was doing was curtailed in a very marked degree? Let us never forget that the more the work presses on, the more time must be spent in prayer. Number six. Jesus Christ prayed before the great temptations of his life. As he drew nearer and nearer to the cross and realized that upon it was to come the great finale test of his life. Jesus went out into the garden to pray. He came, quote, unto a place called Gethsemane, and said unto his disciples, Set ye here while I go and pray yonder, unquote. Matthew 26, verse 36. The victory of Calvary was won that night in the garden of Gethsemane. The calm majesty of his bearing in meeting the awful onslaughts of Pilate's judgment hall and of Calvary was the outcome of the struggle, agony, and victory of Gethsemane. While Jesus prayed, the disciples slept. So he stood fast while they fell ignoramously. Many temptations come upon us unawares and unannounced. And all that we can do is to lift a cry to God for help then and there. But many of the temptations of life we can see approaching from the distance. And in such cases, the victory should be won before the temptation really reaches us. Number seven. In First Thessalonians 5.17, we read, quote, Pray without ceasing, unquote. And in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18, R.V., Quote, praying at all seasons, unquote. Our whole life should be a life of prayer. We should walk in constant communion with God. There should be a constant upward looking of the soul to God. We should walk so habitually in his presence that even when we awake in the night, it would be the most natural thing in the world for us to speak to him in thanksgiving or in petition. 